Okay, good afternoon to one and all. A very warm welcome to another lecture in the IALS Distinguished Speaker Program conducted by Symbiosis Law School, Pune. Today we have the honor of hosting Justice Emmanuel Ugira Shabuja, President of East African Court of Justice, Tanzania, and Dean Emeritus um, University of Rwanda School of Law, who will be conducting a guest lecture on the principles of environmental rule of law and how law courts have applied them. To welcome our distinguished guest uh, and to introduce the IALS uh, Distinguished Speaker Program, we have with us Dr. Shashikala Gurpur, a uh, professor, director of Symbiosis Law School, Pune, Dean, Faculty of Law, Symbiosis International, Deemed University. Dr. Shashikal Gurpur is a distinguished academician and orator, having presented more than 200 invited lectures, workshops, and seminars in prestigious universities across the globe. Dr. Gurpur has been instrumental and has made tremendous contributions in the internationalization efforts at Symbiosis International Deemed University, especially for the law schools under its banner. The internationalization efforts include impressive number of international collaborations with universities across the world, students and faculty exchange, international projects like Eurasia 21st Century Teach Skills Project, DAG and Erasmus Grants, and membership with international bodies such as the International Association of Law School, uh, Asian Law Institute, International Union for Conservation of Nature, and the Global Alliance for Justice Education. In recognition of her contribution to the Indian legal academia, she was listed in the book 100 Legal Luminaries of India by Alexis Nexus. Dr. Gurpur has also been conferred with the prestigious annual Kitturani Chennama Award by the government of Karnataka, India in 2018 for her work towards the empowerment of women. Thank you for joining us today, ma'am. We request you to kindly welcome our distinguished guest and introduce the IELS Distinguished Speaker Lecture Series to the audience. Thank you, Professor Lama. Uh, a very warm welcome from uh, to Justice Emmanuel Udira Shabuja. Um, we have interacted a lot on the ILS. I have seen you as a very, very bright uh, expert, uh, and also very scholarly specialist uh, in our midst. So it's a privilege to present you before our young students. Um, our association back to 2007, uh, and the American Association of Law Schools came out with its international arm, namely AALS, way back in 2005. Now, IALS has become how to name as uh, we are concerned because it is to IALS that we have to uh, enrich our collaborations. We were able to participate in IALS initiative of quality legal education. Um, and also, there is also uh, just like how we have uh, as the idea to bring uniform standards of education, commonly agreed standards of education. So, IELS represents a soft diplomacy in the form of uh, ameliorating the quality of education, unifying the legal. Uh, education standards. And one of the most positive contributions to this body of think uh, tank and this body of experts was the official commission. The introduction through the dynamic thinking of President Frank. Frank. We have had the privilege of introducing some judges, Indian judges to this forum, but I'm extremely pleased to uh, uh, learn from a craft on this forum, especially from some judges. Uh, among them, the foremost, uh, uh, although relatively younger today, is uh, Justice Emmanuel. Uh, Justice Emmanuel has had a long stint as dean uh, of a lead law university and then has become now the uh, uh, chief judge of the American court. Uh, and this court uh, has got certain issues which are looking at unique uh, themes such as uh, environment, etc. Uh, uh, Justice Emmanuel has been environment issue. I must tell you that this uh, initiative has started of giving uh, special guest lectures and lectures by experts. 
uh, in this uh, challenging our belief in one woman, our belief in unifying all the audience of the world as thought leaders, and our belief in uh, engaging our students in this kind of uh, stretching the mind kind of thinking has been uh, uh, expressed in this uh, initiative. I'm very happy that students have been exposed in last few weeks to Justice Gladstone, a whole school from South Africa, uh, just headed in the former judge from Europe, Justice from Ireland. We have had uh, another judge from Italy, uh, recently a very senior judge. Uh, and then uh, Francesca, and then we have had Justice uh, Manuel. Um, I must tell you, students, that the little conversation with Justice Manuel and uh, learning about his background, that unification of the Indian Union idea, which resulted in a lot of benefits some of the uh, otherwise uh, the corners of Europe, has been implicated in the regional organization effort, which is also you know. Uh, Reflected in United Nations Charter. Uh, but these regional efforts have been uh, very heavily uh, divided but united in Asia. For example, Southeast Asian unification, whereas uh, Asian unification with the India in the lead, China in the lead, with India in the lead, just in the Asia Association, and then the Middle East coming together in terms of oil exports and also as part of the Western Asian Union have been the efforts which have been the inspiration for the efforts which have been happening in Africa. So I was very heartened that they have put it in the central stage. Whereas if you look at Asia, the environment stage has not been very sincerely or strong compared to putting the economic integration or compared to putting economic cooperation. So today's lecture is going to be very important for you to uh, address one of the most, uh, disturbing themes of Asia, that is environment because what we are facing today. Um, is uh, both the cause and the consequence of our anthropogenic approach to environment than uh, ecocentric uh, approach to environment. Um, some of the issues like zoonotic issues, for example, animal uh, viruses or animal diseases which have been uh, uh, tormenting humankind in the last uh, decade, right from h one n and we have had the bird flu, we have had uh, Ebola, and now we have had, uh, we had Zika virus, and now we are having the COVID. Now, all these point to the irresponsible way in which we have been dealing with the environment, and those who have been shared in the environment with us. So, today's lecture is going to show and pave the way about how COVID uh, battled with such uh, questions and courts have put the environment with four universally agreed principles of intergenerational equity, polluted waste, or uh, public trust in terms of I'm sure, Judge Emmanuel, you bring some of these dimensions to the fore in your talk with the active cases, active cases, and experiential richness that will be basing the talk by four to our students are going to be the future sentinels of justice and conscience keepers of India, India which like Africa is uh, blessed with environmental resources, but mm -hmm. equally responsible in uh, uh, aggressive approach like the Ho Brentland report, our common future report pointed out long ago. The balance of the two and in the light of the doctrine uh, which has been now taken as a Evolved objective by so I'm sure that are interested in international environmental law, in uh, international law, international law as their main course will definitely be uh, enriched by a gifted person like you who is both a justice and a teacher. Uh, now, when the forum is being handed over to you, uh, I welcome you and I welcome all the students to this enriching dialogue. Uh, thank you for agreeing to uh, uh, interact with us, uh, Justice Emmanuel. So over to the party. Thank you, ma'am.
It is my privilege to now introduce to our audience our distinguished guest for today. Justice Dr. Emmanuel Ugirishaboja has a wide experience from being an international judge, practitioner, and international law scholar, and as a result of which he is well equipped to contribute to the fulfillment of the mission of the International Court of Justice. He has finished his PhD in law uh, from the University of Edinburgh and his LLM from the same university in public international law and international relations, international economic law and international environmental law after receiving his law degree from the University of Rwanda. He is the presiding judge of the East African Court of Justice Appellate Division, just, uh, judges uh, of the East African Court of Justice, uh, President of the East African Court of Justice Arbitration Tribunal, Chair of the East African Court Rules Committee, Member of the East African Magistrates and Judges Association, Member of the Interim Government Committee of the Global Judicial Institute of the, on the Environment. He also acted in the position of Member of the Rwandan Superior Council of Judiciary until 2013 and Rwandan Supreme Court Council of Prosecution. Uh, he was also the Dean of the Faculty of uh, National Law University of Rwanda, uh, which is now the uh, University of Rwanda from 2009 to 2014. Uh, he was a professor of public international law and international organizations, environmental law, international economic, trade and financial law at the University of Rwanda from 2008 to 2014. So as a accomplished and distinguished uh, academician as well as a practitioner. We are honored to have you as our distinguished guest addressing our students today, sir. Sir, unmute yourself. Sir, you're muted. Uh, do you like to press on the Okay, I think someone muted me from that side. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, the director of uh, Symbiosis Law School, Dr. Shashkala Gurpur. It is. It gives me a great pleasure to be invited to give this lecture on this important topic of the principles of environmental rule of law and how law courts have applied them. I wish to commend the leadership of Symbiosis Law School for the stewardship in the debate on diverse subjects of law relevant to the 21st century. Uh, distinguished uh, professors and young students, it is scarcely debatable in this time and age that the anthropogenic stresses on the environment are now causing unprecedented transgression of planetary boundaries manifested by climate change loss of bi biodiversity, depletion of natural resources, and other environmental degradations. It is also equally indisputable that humanity exists within nature and that all life depends on the integrity of the biosphere and the interdependence of the ecological systems. Uh, Earth's, Earth's living, uh, sorry, Earth's life-giving systems are under unprecedented stress. When you read books such as the one uh, published by Stefan W. et al., The Trajectory of Anthropocene, The Great Acceleration, we have transgressed at least four planetary boundaries out of nine, those of climate change, land conversion, nitrogen and phosphorus loading, and biodiversity loss. The concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere now exceeds 350 parts per million. It is over 400 parts per million, and still raising, leading to hotter, drier, and more hostile climate. Synthetic fertilizers containing nitrogen and phosphorus are being added to earth soils more than twice their safe levels. This has led to the collapse of aquatic life in many lakes, rivers, and oceans. Only 62% of the land that could be forested still stands as forest, and it continues to shrink, reducing earth's capacity to act as a carbon sink. Biodiversity loss is severe. Species extinction occurs at least 10 times faster than the planetary boundary. Since 1970, the number of mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fish worldwide has fallen by half. This is according to the World 
uh, Wildlife uh, Forum report. This is a stark picture of humanity and planetary home. There are tipping points which, are, which we are still pushing on, and I don't know how far we are going to push this on uh, to our detriment. Uh, this wanton destruction of environment contributes to an insecure, conflict-prone, and unjust place for humanity. So the vital, the vital question relevant to this presentation is, what role does or can the judiciary play in the protection of the environment, thereby ensuring a safe and just space for humanity? It has been at that time and again that judiciaries have neither the sword of the executive nor the pass of the legislature, but merely judgment. The role of the judiciary is limited to the application of the law to cases brought before the courts. The important question to muse here then is, what can judges do to positively impact on the functioning of humanity life support systems in the light of the above limitations uh, that we see that courts only deal with cases which are brought before them? And like obviously you have the mandate similar to the green courts in India where courts can begin cases to a motto, but this is exceptional. Uh, uh, distinguished uh, listeners, a good study, a starting point is that the judges should abide by the principles of rule of law. But what does the concept of rule of law here mean? Uh, Lord Bingham's seminal work on the rule of law in his book entitled The Rule of Law exposed that the rule of law is not, as is often regarded, a vague concept. He defines the rule of law succinctly as such, uh, and I quote, all persons and authorities, whether public or private, should be bound by and entitled to the benefit of laws publicly made, taking effect generally in the future and publicly administered in court, end of quote. Lord Bingham supplements this definition with eight ingredients of the rule of law, which are practically conceivable and very specific. The ingredients are, the first one is that law be accessible, clear and predictable. Number two, that matters are decided by law and not normally by discretion. Number three, that there is equality before the law. Number four, that power be exercised lawfully, fairly, and reasonably. Number five, that human rights are protected. Number six, that disputes are resolved without undue cost or delay. Number seven, that trials be fair. And lastly, that the state complies with the, its obligations in international law as well as national law. On a practical point of view, let me illustrate to you how environmental cases come before courts. The first way that uh, environmental cases come before courts is through constitutional rights litigation. An increase, an increase in number of constitutions have an explicit right of environment. There are quite a number of those uh, constitutions. I could name a lot of them, but uh, this will take a lot of time, but it's a number, especially those in the Commonwealth countries. Uh, others, other constitutions have provisions which, I, which have an implied right to a clean environment has, that has been inferred to. And further, assuming enforceability and justiciability, environmental concerns have been pre presented in fundamental rights. Uh, due to time limitations, I will deal with cases where environmental rights have been extrapolated from existing human rights. Uh, one of the uh, landmark cases that I assume that you all know is the Atakoya versus the Union of India, where the court held that the right to sweet water, which is unpolluted water, attributes of the right to life, for these are the basic elements which sustain life itself. Uh, this was uh, uh, a, a, the right to uh, sweet water was extrapolated from Article 21 of the Indian Constitution. In another similar case, which is the Social and Economic Rights Action Center uh, and the Center for Economic and Social Rights uh, versus Nigeria, a case which is commonly referred to as the Ogoni land case, which was brought before the African Court on Human and People's Rights. Uh, the African Court on Human and People's Rights has a human rights jurisdiction of our African countries, including most of the African Commonwealth countries. It held the view that if environment is degraded by pollution 
and it affects the quality of life and safety of life protected by such rights as the right to life, the right to health, the right to satisfactory living conditions, then those rights themselves are breached. Thus, the right of, to a clean environment can be extrapolated from existing rights. This is what these two courts uh, concluded. That's uh, the High Court in, in India in the Atakoya case, as well as the uh, African Court on Human and People's Rights uh, here in uh, Africa. Uh, thus, uh, uh, the conclusion of this court is that the right to clean environment can be extrapolated from existing rights. No one can capture the nexus of human rights and environment better than Judge Wera Mantri of the International Court of Justice, who in a separate opinion in the Gabchikovo Nagimaros project case, in that case took place in 1997, uh, the judgment uh, was delivered in 1997. Judge Wera Mantri opined that the, and I quote him, that the protection of the environment is likewise a vital part of contemporary human rights doctrine, for it is a sine qua non for numerous human rights such as the right to health and the right to life itself. It is scarcely necessary to elaborate on this, as damage to environment can impair and undermine the human rights spoken of in the Universal Declaration and other human rights instruments end of quote of that opinion by Judge Vera Mantley. So the view espoused here is that environment and fundamental human rights are intertwined and decoupling fundamental rights from environmental law is simply unrealistic and will not be the be in the best interest of protecting the fundamental rights we deeply cherish as a, as a society. So what is the second way that cases come before court? Well, environmental cases. Uh, we've just talked of um, uh, constitutional uh, rights litigation. The second way is action in torts. This is the most common and traditional way that environmental cases have been brought to courts, especially in common law jurisdictions. Actions in tort law generally include nu nuisance, negligence, and trespass. In actions in torts, parties generally seek damage or injunctions to stop particular actions which specifically affect them and by extension degrade the environment. Historically, standing rules in actions in torts have tended to limit access to courts unless plaintiff can show a, proper, a property of financial interest. Uh, by way of example, nuisance has generally been defined in a number of cases at common law as an indirect interference with a person's land or enjoyment of land because of noise, smell, air pollution, or water pollution. And public nuisance has been defined as an activity which material affects, materially affects the reasonable comfort and convenience of the public. The third way that cases find their way in the, in the courts is actions challenging government action. This includes actions challenging uh, uh, government actions as well as inactions or delay. A number of legal issues unique to this type of litigation include the standard of review, the amount of difference given to a court in reviewing the decisions of a government and its agencies, for example, environmental agencies. Uh, how far can court review the decisions of government and, um, and agencies? Over years, courts have adopted a systematic balance analysis which includes a high standard of consideration of environmental factors, a standard which must be rigorously enforced by reviewing courts. Let's take an example of a very recent case. I think it's a 2019 case uh, which took place in Kenya. Uh, it's referred to as Save Lamu and others versus the National Environmental Management Authority and uh, Amu Power Company Limited. Uh, this is uh, commonly referred to as the Lamu coal plant case. Uh, this case referred to public participation as the oxygen by which the environmental impact assessment study and report are given life. The court was of the view that um, there should be a strict adherence to environmental impact assessment regulations, thus refusing to accept a checkbox approach to public participation. It emphasized the importance of 
climate change assessment in environmental impact assessments and found that its omission in the coal plant environmental impact assessment study made the report inadequate and incomplete. It focused, it focused on the omission of the environmental impact assessment and the mitigation measures. This case further focused on the role of uh, the National Environmental Management Authority of Kenya in ensuring that effective public, public participation was undertaken, which includes ensuring that sufficient information is provided to the people who are likely to be directly affected. And lastly, the court emphasized the importance of strategic environmental assessment, particularly when, concerned, when considering other alternatives locations for the project site at a policy level. Uh, the second legal issue that you look at when you're challenging actions of the state is, is the scope of the review. This involves the extent of judicial review of government in environmental matters. Finally, uh, another important legal aspect that is looked into is the time frame of review. In other words, the statutory uh, time limitations. Most of these issues are provided for either broadly or restrictively in legislations or, or treaties. The fourth way in which environmental cases find their way in courts is through criminal prosecu prosecutions. Criminal prosecutions maximize deterrence message. Uh, remedies often include imprisonment or hefty fines. Standard of proof is beyond reasonable doubt, and it's more demanding than the, than the civil standards. Uh, you find these cases mostly in, um, in, a, in a courts in Africa, where they, they are dealing with um, illegal sale of uh, trophies or endangered species, uh, especially in Tanzania, where I live, in the domestic courts of Tanzania. Um, Distinguished listeners, in dealing with environmental matters, courts have been faced with the following procedural uh, quandaries. The first is access to court. Uh, the question that courts do face is standing. What rules are there for standing? Are they restrictive or broad? Is public interest litigation or axio popularis or class action permitted? These are questions that judges have to answer when dealing with environmental cases. The other uh, question uh, uh, relevant to standing is, are there financial and technical barriers to access to the courts? For example, is the court at liberty to invite experts or to admit friends of the court who, specialized in, who specialize in environmental matters? Finally, is there legal aid, technical assistance with evidence? So these are questions which are answered either in the legislation or maybe through the development of the jurisprudence of a given country. Historically, standing rules have tended to limit access to courts unless the plaintiff can show pro a property of financial interest. However, of recent increasingly, the right of the public to participate in environmental matters is viewed as a fundamental notion of justice and, is, and essential to the rule of law. Principle 10 of the 1992 Rio Declaration on, on, environment and, yeah, on Environment and Development seeks to ensure that every person has access to information, can participate in the decision-making process, and has access to justice in environmental matters with the aim of safeguarding the right to a healthy and sustainable envir environment for present and future generations. Courts, especially in Commonwealth countries, have over time tended to be liberal when it comes to standing in environmental matters, even where the law is silent. Uh, I can give you examples. Let's take the example of the Environmental Action Network Limited versus the Attorney General uh, of, the, of uh, Uganda and the National Environmental Management Authority of Uganda. The Environmental Action Network sued the government seeking protections from smoking in public places. Um, the Environmental Action Network contended that such measures were required for the good, for the general good of public health in Uganda and to enforce the right to a clean and healthy environment and the right to life. Um, 
The Honorable Principal Judge, Mr. Justice J.H. Nabgoa, in this case, as he was then, of the High Court of Uganda, held that Article 50 of the Ugandan Constitution did allow public interest litigation by the plaintiff, given that the interest of public rights should transcend procedural technicalities. In another case, uh, the R versus Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Pollution, Greenpeace Limited, number no. two of 1994, it was held by the High Court in the United Kingdom that nonetheless, the applicant had sufficient interest in the issues raised for it to be granted local standing. Its supporters may not have an effective opportunity to bring an action individually, and it was entirely appropriate that an established body with genuine interest in the issue should do so on behalf of its members. So the cases are bound in uh, the Commonwealth uh, courts where they've taken a liberal stand when it comes to the question of standing. Uh, on the other hand, there are certain countries and courts in those countries which have been extremely restrictive when it comes to the question of standing. Uh, I can give you an example of uh, Nigeria. Even though a common law country in tradition, it has consi uh, consistently taken the stand that a litigant cannot sue unless he or she can show that his or her rights are in harm. The interpretation of local standing uh, before the courts, as I said, in most com common, common law jurisdiction is li liberal. The Nigeria stance is uh, a bit an exception. Um, and uh, you can see this in quite a number of cases. And I will share with you the, my paper so that you can look at the cases that I refer to. Uh, of interest, and this is a very recent phenomenon, certain features such as rivers have been granted legal standing. Rivers around the world, as you all know, have been desecrated in every way. Now the Ganges and uh, New Zealand's uh, Wanganui rivers have legal standing uh, in themselves, uh, and this will protect their rights. Uh, several geographically distant but related events have recently signaled a dramatic mind shift in humanity's troubled uh, relationship with nature. First, the New Zealand pan, uh, Parliament passed uh, an act which is referred to as Te, Te Awa Tupua Act, giving the Wanganui River and ecosystem a legal standing in its own right, guaranteeing its well-being and health. Uh, uh, and you all know that um, uh, the High Court in India ruled that the Ganges and the uh, Yamuna rivers and their related ecosystems have the status of a legal person with all corresponding rights and duties and uh, liabilities in order to preserve and conserve them. Uh, the New Zealand broad approach uh, towards standing, giving um, certain features uh, legal standing, may prove more effective in the long run by granting natural entities personhood, one by one, and assigning them specific guardians. Over time, New Zealand, as well as uh, the, the approach taken by the High Court uh, uh, of India, uh, could drastically change an ossified legal system that still sees oceans, mountains, and forests primarily as property, guaranteeing nature its day in court. Uh, another important procedural uh, issues that courts have to deal with is the question of forum non-convenience. In law, the term forum non-convenience refers to the discretionary power of a court to not hear a case that may be more appropriately or more conveniently heard in another court. The exercise of forum non-convenience results in the dismissal of the case, but does not prevent the plaintiff from filing the case in a different case, usually the one that the original court recommends. Let me give you an example of a, a very, uh, uh, a, a very uh, landmark case. It's a landmark case which I'm going to refer to, and it's the reunited Union Carbide Corporation uh, gas plant disaster. Uh, uh, which was brought before the Southern District of the New York uh, State in 1986. The origin of the case goes back almost uh, uh, half a century ago, 
when construction of a pesticide plant began in the lakeside town of Bhopal in the India state of uh, Madhya Pradesh, the American-owned Union Carbide Corporation, UCC, within the thriving co uh, chemical industry, focused its attention on the Indian subcontinent. Uh, irregularities cul cul culminated in the disaster on the night of uh, the 3rd December 1984, when a toxic gas leak from the tank E610 in the methyl uh, uh, isocyanate plant got out of control, uh, control. The deadly chemical cloud was quickly blown by the wind to the densely populated neighborhood next to the railway station. The controversy as to the extent, uh, the exact number of the deaths that occurred that night still continues today. And although, although the UCC acknowledges 3,800 deaths, victims association, and impartial, in, uh, impartial investigators estimate that over 8,000 deaths and at least 150,000 injured, injured, injuries occurred. Forum non-convenience was applied in the Southern District uh, Court of New York. And in the end, uh, the, the SDNY uh, courts decided that uh, the Indian courts was considered more adequate for trying, for trying the case, thereby avoiding all the evidence that was maintained by Professor Galanta uh, about, why, about the main reasons why the case should be entertained by the Southern District uh, of New York. However, uh, forum non-convenience is being considered differently in Europe nowadays. In the recent case of uh, Lungoa versus the Vendanta uh, resource case, uh, which is a case from uh, which was uh, instituted uh, by by uh, certain uh, uh, casualties of uh, of uh, an investment in, in India, uh, both the High Court and Court of Appeal of the United Kingdom grappled with the question of the appropriate forum to deal with a case involving 1,826 Zambian nations, uh, nationals who are the claimants against the Zambia-based Concola Copper Mines, uh, PLC, and its London-based parent, Vendetta Resource, PLC. The claimants commenced proceedings in the United Kingdom, alleging personal injury and damage of property loss of income and loss of amenity, and enjoyment of land arising out of the alleged pollution and environmental damage caused by the disposal of tailings and other effluent of Nachanga copper mine from 2005 to 2015 into a neighboring river called the Kafua River and the adjacent waterways. The claimants pleaded that they relied on the waterways as their primary source of clean water for drinking, bathing, cooking, cleaning, and other domestic recreational uh, purposes, and that the waterways are used to irrigate crops, sustain livestock, and as a source of fresh fish. From the onset, Vendata and KCM challenged the jurisdiction of the United Kingdom courts on the basis of forum non-convenience. And they argued that the claims against Vendata were launched illegitimately Maybe, may, merely as a hook to obtain the English jurisdiction of a KCM. On their side, the claimants argued that um, Article 4 of the recast, recast Brussels regulations, these are the EU regulations uh, on jurisdiction, provide that a clear and unqualified right to sue a United Kingdom domicile company in the United Kingdom and that Article 4 allows, allows for no discretion or disqualification to, uh, to that simple proposition. The claimants relied on a very famous case, which is the Ousu versus the Jackson case, which is a decision of the United Court, uh, so the, which is a decision of the European Court of Justice, which plainly made it clear that the doctrine of forum non-convenience has no role to play uh, in, in the European area in the European Union area, and that the Brussels Convention precludes a court of a contracting state from declining the jurisdictions conferred on it by Article 4, on the ground that a court of a non-contracting state would be a more appropriate forum. So the, the doctrine of forum non-convenience 
has been set aside, at least for the area of the European Union. The Court of Appeal of the United Kingdom agreed with Judge Carlson of the High Court of the United Kingdom and dismissed the vendetta's uh, jurisdiction appeal, holding that the European Union laws impose mandatory jurisdiction on the English courts for claims against any English company which has uh, invested in uh, other third parties. In other words, forum non-convenience cannot be used as a jurisdiction bar in, in English courts as long as they are bound by the European Union law and the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. Uh, distinguished uh, participants to this guest lecture, Allow me to now discuss some of the recent emerging principles in the resolution of environmental disputes. Uh, the first principle that has emerged over the recent, the, recent, uh, the, the very recent uh, uh, times is the principle of indubio pro natura. This principle is found in the 2016 uh, IUCN World Declaration on the Environmental Rule of Law which espouses the idea that in cases of doubt in environmental matters, that doubt should be resolved in a way most likely to favor the protection and the conservation of the environment with preferences given to alternatives that are least harmful to the environment. Uh, in a case which this court, the court that I serve in the East African Court of Justice dealt with, that's the African Network uh, for Animal Welfare, versus the Attorney General of the United Republic of Tanzania. This case is commonly known as the Serengeti case. Just to give you a brief overview of the case, the United Republic of Tanzania wanted to build a superhighway in the, in the Serengeti reserved area, which is, one of the, uh, uh, which is one of the reserved areas with a lot of species of uh, animals and uh, as well of flora and fauna. Uh, and, um, the animal network for the African network for animal welfare challenged this case before the court. Uh, it came before the first instance of this court and later on was appealed in this case. And the appellate division which I serve in, when answering the question of whether the case was ripe, uh, because what the animal network of, sorry, the African network of animal welfare was challenging was um, a planned activity of building this road. And Tanzania was arguing that you cannot challenge an idea which has not been put in place. And um, um, the appellate division, which I serve in, uh, was of the view that notwithstanding the doctrine of, the doctrine of mootness, the trial court did not err uh, in granting an injunction to, to restrain the United Republic of Tanzania from ever implementing its proposal to construct the Serengeti Superhighway as an initial plan. In our view, the grant of the injunction was proper and justified given the imminent risk of irreversible uh, damage inherent in any attempt to implement the plan of building the road, even though the plan had not come into fruition. In other words, even though the threshold of an action of a state had not been attained, United Republic of Tanzania was restrained from ever implementing that proposal to construct the, the Serengeti Superhighway as initially planned. Just recently in Pakistan, the Lahore Highway High Court, uh, sorry, uh, pardon me. Um, just recently in Pakistan, the Lahore High Court relied on the principle of indubio pro natura in the maple leaf cement factory versus the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, Chief Justice Syed, Syed Mansour Al Shah, who is also one of the uh, board members of the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment, as I am, cited um, principle five of the World Declaration on the Environmental Rule of Law. And I cite him what he said in this judgment. He, uh, as for, he provided as follows, he opined as follows. Another emerging environmental principle, perhaps more appropriate in this case, declared as principle five of the IUCN World Declaration of the Environmental Rule of Law is indubio pro natura, i.e. 
In cases of doubt, all matters before courts, administrative agencies, and other decision makers should be resolved in a way most likely to favor the protection and conservation of the environment, with preference to be given to alternatives that are least harmful to the environment. Actions should be and that should not be undertaken where the potential adverse impacts on the environment are disproportionate or, ex or excessive in relation to the benefits derived therefrom. In that case, there was to be a survey of the salt range in Punjab in order to delineate positive and negative areas for the grant of mining concessions. Although the project of of the petitioner cement company was located in the salt range, it was not yet known whether it might or might not fall within a negative area. The court held that taking a precautionary approach and relying on the principle of indubio pro natura, as it is uncertain that what the survey of the salt range might hold, the courts must favor environmental protection. Uh, this principle of indubio pro natura is closely linked to another well-known principle of precautionary. Uh, in the appeals decision in one of the two lawsuits filed by the San Joaquin uh, Valley Irrigation Districts, that's um, uh, in, the, in the Southern California, uh, and the judge in this case, Judge Richard Tolman, wrote the opinion and say, uh, that uh, he wrote the opinion that uh, even though the best scientific data was not available, uh, uh, you can always deal with science which is not perfect, and uh, this should be done in, uh, in favor of the environment. Uh, the second important principle that has emerged over the course of years of determining uh, environmental rule of law cases before courts is the principle of ecological function of property. This principle means that any natural legal persons or group of people in possession or in control of land or other resources have the duty to maintain the essential ecological functions associated with those resources and refrain from activities that would impair, the, that will, would impair such functions. Legal ob obligations to restore ecological conditions of land, water or other resources are binding on all owners, occupiers and users of a site and liabilities not terminated by the transfer of use or title to others. Uh, just to give the context of uh, this principle, I may cite one of the cases from Uganda again. Uh, this case is referred to as the Nyakana versus the National Environmental Management Authority of Uganda. This case presented an important issue pertaining to the protection of the environment, where it conflicts with individual property rights in the area of conservation of wetlands, which are a source of fresh water rivers in Uganda. The court characterized the, <coughs> the, court characterized the wetland as having immense ecological and economic importance, not only to the city, but also to Uganda as a country and the African region such as it drains in the Lake Victoria. The court concluded that even though property rights were protected, the use of such property should be regulated for purposes of promoting and protecting the environment for the common good, which is referred to as the public interest uh, good. Uh, the, third, uh, the third emerging principle uh, is the polluter pays and internalization of external environmental costs. The Privy Council noted that the aspects of polluter pays principle in Fisherman Friends of the Sea versus the Minister of Planning, Housing and the Environment, uh, the, the Privy Council noted that it must be understood that as requiring the person who causes the pollution and that that person alone has to bear not only the costs of remedying pollution, but also those arising from the implementation of a policy of, pre of prevention. The polluter pays principle can be seen to be reflected in at least two situations in the courts, in sentencing for environmental crime and in making civil orders, including imposing pecuniary penalties and granting 
injunctive relief. Uh, distinguished uh, uh, audience, uh, coming to my conclusion, of course, all of us judges operate within territorial boundaries defined by rules of jurisdiction. Each jurisdiction has its own distinct history and culture and its own constitutional treaty arrangement and institutions. Courts cannot all of a sudden break away from their historic and domestic cultural foundations. At the same time, we cannot escape from the reality that certain areas and principles of law in fields such as environmental law, law operate across jurisdictions. Judges have in recent times recognized this reality and have come up with a very important initiative of establishing an institute known, known as the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment. The institute has launched, was launched in, 2000, in 2016 in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and has the mission of supporting the role of courts and tribunals in applying and enforcing environmental laws, in promoting the environmental rule of law. The Institute is composed of actively sitting judges from around the world. It provides opportunities for collaboration, strengthening capacities and, provide, and provides research and analysis on topics important for environmental adjudications, court practices and environmental rule of law. Uh, distinguished audience, like most infrastructure projects, environmental rule of law requires continual maintenance, upkeep and renovation. This applies to the ways in which the, court, the environmental rule of law is conceived, its comprehensibility, its practical effects, its adequacy to meet the purpose for which it was conceived. Working upon and within that infrastructure, observing and theorizing about it are legal academics, judges such as myself, legal practitioners, business community, and a great variety of other stakeholders. They represent diverse yet overlapping groups with a variety of occupational and organizational cultures, worldviews and purposes, as well as methodologies. Uh, let me conclude by, by saying that I firmly believe that this generation of students with all its energy, questioning, new perspectives and potential for innovation is well placed to, posit to positively contribute to the growth of the jurisprudence of the environmental rule of law and also to jealously guard the independence of the courts which determine these cases. The ongoing efforts by the Symbiosis Law School to shape and improve the discourse on important subjects of law are impressive. It is a great endeavor you all undertake and I take this opportunity to wish you well with it. Let me once again thank you for your attention, and I do look forward to any observations, questions, uh, uh, or any other views that you may have at this point in time. Thank you very much, sir, for your insightful and expertly delivered lecture on the national principles of environmental law and rule of law, bringing practical aspects with, uh, with various examples, not only from Africa and Europe, but also from India. Thank you very much, sir. We'll now move on to uh, the discussion session where we'll have Professor Raj Verma facilitating the question and answer session with the audience. So, may I please invite Professor Raj Verma? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. So the first question is, do you believe that the establishment of an international environmental court with a global jurisdiction will be a step forward in establishing a universal environmental jurisprudence and at the same time ensuring that the sustainable development goals are followed and enforced? Thank you for that question. Uh, I think the question, if I had you well, there were some echoes, uh, is do I believe whether an establishment of a, of a global environmental court uh, will play an important role in uh, ensuring that um, environmental rule of law is uh, sustained and, uh, and uh, as well as uh, whether the sustainable uh, development goals can be achieved as a result of this environmental court. Well, I, I, I do believe that, um, and this is a question which has been um, debated uh, 
over time the concept of an environment of a global environmental court. It is a concept that I believe in, but um, uh, the truth of the matter is we cannot achieve this in the very near future. Um, um, it has been discussed over and over in the realm of uh, international law, uh, but um, uh, um, due to the fact that uh, in reality it has caused a lot of uh, uh, controversies, I don't believe we can achieve this in the near future. And that's why in the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment, we have um, decided to focus mostly on uh, domestic jurisdictions which deal with uh, the day-to-day -day environmental uh, cases. And um, we do believe that instead of uh, concentrating our efforts on a, on a dream, which will probably not come to fruition, it's better that we bring together judges from different jurisdictions in international courts, such as mine, in domestic courts worldwide, in order to give them a forum through the Institute to be able to discuss and exchange practices in order to be able to move forward in dealing with these cases of, of environment. And I can assure you that um, in the four years that the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment has been established, uh, experiences have been exchanged. And uh, you can see that uh, it, it's leading to uh, a more, um, I would say, uh, harmonized way of domestic courts and international courts dealing with the question of, uh, of, an, of uh, environmental rule of law. Uh, and um, I do believe that this trend will continue uh, if the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment is supported uh, adequately. But uh, as an idea, I totally agree with you that uh, uh, the Global Judicial, a Global Environmental Court would play an important role in sustaining uh, uh, environmental rule of law. Thank you, sir. So, as uh, recently there's been oil by the Japanese ship. So, Western yes. has international law equipped to handle this huge impact on the marine ecosystem, and who can be held liable for this? Can, can you repeat the question? There are some echoes when I. So, uh, there was an oil spill in the Indian Ocean by a Japanese yes. ship near Mauritius. So, mm -hmm. the question is, with regards to that, how is international law equipped to handle this huge impact on the marine ecosystem? And who can be held liable for this? Yes. Yes, uh, uh, this is a very uh, pertinent question in environmental law. Um, again, I should point out that uh, international law generally uh, has its own uh, limits because uh, international law, as we all agree, is a, is, a, is a body of law which comes into place when states negotiate agreements or maybe customary international law uh, uh, of certain practices and uh, opinion juris have evolved into customary international law. Uh, so the question is, uh, in this issue of the spill uh, of oil in Indian Ocean, uh, is international law well equipped to handle the case? Uh, my view is that yes, it is. And I do believe that um, uh, there is a, a customary international law principle, uh, which, is, um, which is the principle of, um, which is, can, can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, uh, which is the principle, the no harm principle. The no harm principle provides that uh, uh, the actions of one state uh, should not be at the detriment of uh, another state. It should not harm the environment of another state. This is a principle which has um, developed as a customary international law principle. So in itself, I do believe it's sufficient enough uh, uh, to handle this case. Uh, on the question on who, who should be liable, uh, this is a, a question which I cannot uh, answer up front uh, because I've not looked at the details of the case 
I need to look at the details of the case and see whether there's any state responsibility or state liability on, on, um, on, 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 on any of these states which are involved in, uh, in this bill. Was there an, an action or an inaction of, uh, of, of uh, the state involved? Uh, those are the questions which international law will answer and, um, and uh, ultimately with a view of deciding who has uh, the liability. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, I do believe that international law, as it is today, is well equipped. Obviously, the question, to, the, the next question to answer is, which country, which court can handle this case? Uh, as you may probably know, Prof, uh, um, in order for cases to come before courts such as the International Court of Justice, there's always the, questions of, the question of juris, jurisdiction. Have the countries involved uh, granted or consented to the uh, to the jurisdiction of the ICJ. Those are the questions which have been, uh, which have to be answered. And again, this is a limit because in order for the ICJ to have jurisdiction of a uh, of uh, disputes of given states, those states have to have consented to the jurisdiction of the ICJ, making it making it a bit more limited. And if you follow the jurisprudence of the International Court of Justice. Uh, quite a number of cases uh, have been uh, uh, have uh, not been entertained to because of lack of jurisdiction. Yes, so thank you so much. <laughs> so could you So the question is, lately there have been an increasing number of cases such as the Juliana case in the US and the Urganda case in the Netherlands dealing with climate change litigation. So the first part of the question is, do you believe organic environmental reform vis-a-vis -vis climate change effects can occur via courts? And if yes, how? So that is the first question. So if you, there's a second question, if you would like, I'll speak the second question as well. Otherwise you can answer the first question first. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a very pertinent question. And this again leads to the reasoning behind the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment. We do believe that courts have an important role in, um, in uh, forging the way forward for uh, environmental protection, and especially in this case that you've, you've, uh, uh, you've expressed in the area of climate change. The Juliana and Urgenda case are uh, a case in point. Um, uh, these cases, uh, uh, um, the subject matter to this case is uh, whether the states involved, that's the United States and um, the Netherlands, are doing enough in terms of their obligations towards, uh, towards um, uh, ensuring that um, we minimize the effect of uh, climate change. And as you can see, especially with the Urgenda case, the Juliana case is still, uh, I believe, ongoing. The Urgenda case has gone all the way in the Netherlands to the Supreme Court. And it, it, uh, the outcome of it is that uh, the Netherlands uh, has not fully uh, um, complied to, the, to its obligations towards the reduction of, um, of uh, carbon emitting uh, uh, activities, which have an impact on uh, on uh, climate change. And as you can see, this is a, a, a court-induced change in terms of the behavior of the country, in terms of the activities of the state. And this is why I do believe that let us, uh, as people in academia, as uh, judges ourselves, let us concentrate our, and put our efforts more on the already existing courts and how these courts can play their, uh, their important role in ensuring that um, uh, the positively impact on, our pro on the protection of the environment, and especially in the area of, uh, of uh, climate change litigation. Thank you, sir. So the next question on the comparative aspects. Do you think that environmental reform is more sustainable to enact and implement via political processes such as policies and legislations. Part of the question, I think I missed it. There were some echoes. 
pointed out at the beginning of my presentation uh, for us courts we are at the tail end of uh, any rule of law uh, venture uh, we deal with cases that are brought to us but we also have to deal with them in accordance with the laws in place so the starting point should always be uh, uh, the legislation are we empowered as courts uh, enough are we empowered enough to deal with the cases uh with the legislation that we have that's why the political processes are extremely important but let me point out that uh, these political processes do not happen accidentally there has to be uh, all sorts of stakeholders who are supposed to be involved in order to push this political agenda and ensure that legislation is brought in place which will ultimately ensure that courts have um, an enabling environment to deal with uh, cases uh, of, uh, of, uh, of environment of, or environmental rule of law, as, uh, if you may. And um, when I'm talking about stakeholders, I'm thinking of stakeholders such as uh, 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 you distinguished professors in academia. Uh, most of the times when you publish in this area, uh, the political actors will wish to look at what you do and you can always influence this political discourse on the question of environmental rule of law. Uh, why am I saying this? I, and I've always told it to my fellow uh, uh, people in academia or, or, or professors here in Africa when I have an opportunity to speak to them. I've told them that the problem that we have at least here in Africa is that we always wait for the for the legislature to come up with laws and then we critique the laws but this should not be our our only role as people in academia we should be the ones moving the the policy we should anticipate what is happening in many more years to come and uh, start forging that particular uh, start forging the way in dealing with uh, a particular area by uh, by issuing uh, um, policies uh, or alternative policies. And I can assure you that um, when the legislatures or any other policy makers are in the process of making uh, policies or legislation, they once in a while do look at what uh, people in academia have done in order to support uh, what they are going to propose. So this is uh, my view on this. Yes, the political processes are important, but all the stakeholders should play their due, their fair role. Uh, so I think you can more. Uh, you had spoken about illegal poaching and exporting and trophy hunting in Africa. So the question is that: Do you think a specialized tribunal for these matters will help? and to hold criminals accountable? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I really don't have a, a, an either or answer to this. Um, uh, yes, specialized uh, tribunals are very important in dealing with certain aspects, but at the, at the same time, there comes a time when when you specialize too much you lose track of other important aspects of uh, of law when we are dealing with the question of uh, 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 illegal trade in uh, in trophies and um, even more uh, disturbing endangered species uh, when you have you are dealing with uh, crimes you are dealing with uh, criminal offenses uh, maybe having a, a specialized court uh, would lead to those judges being experts in this area and maybe it will make it, it much more better. But at the same time, I also do believe that um, uh, even where you have general criminal courts, uh, the focus should be on training these judges uh, to be able to deal with uh, 
uh, questions of evidence because these are very pertinent issues when it comes to these crimes. Uh, questions of how to deal with these um, cases. Uh, and uh, we've seen that, um, and I can give you example of here in Tanzania, where due to lack of uh, expertise of judges in this area, a lot of cases go unpunished uh, because of um, because of lack of expertise, not only of the judges, but also of the prosecutors and also of the police who are supposed to investigate these cases. So I do believe that uh, we should concentrate rather more on uh, on the uh, human resource part of uh, the people who deal with these cases, right from the investigating police to the prosecutors to the judges and uh, train as many judges as possible, uh, rather than uh, having um, a specialized um, uh, 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 court. I, I want to point it out to you that um, uh, mostly the cases are lost even before they reach the, the courts uh, due to the way the investigations have been handled. So uh, you may have a very good specialized court on, um, on, uh, on the illegal trade of trophies and, uh, and endangered species. But at the same time, it may not achieve the intended uh, uh, outcome if the investigation does not take place in a, in a proper way. Thank you very much, sir, for answering all the questions of the students. Uh, I would now, um, on behalf of Symbiosis Law School Pune, extend my gratitude to Justice Emmanuel Akira Shapuja for your valuable time for sharing your expertise and insight into international environmental concerns with our students. Uh, we hope that we have many more such occasions to collaborate and learn from you in the future. We are grateful uh, for, to our visionary leader, Dr. Shashikala Gurpur, for her tenacity and excellence in ensuring legal education and exposing both our faculty and students to international standards of education. Thank you very much, ma'am. I thank the organizers of the program, Professor Sujata Arya, along with the International Cell, Professor Raj Verma for facilitating the discussion, and uh, the IT team for their consistent support and guidance. Last but not the least, I thank all the students who participated and made this program effective and successful. Thank you all very much.